Good afternoon, everybody. My name is E.R. Anderson. I'm the executive director of Kara Circle. Kara Circle is a nonprofit programming arm of Keras Books, and Keras Books is the South's oldest independent feminist bookstore. We are so excited to be with all of you around the world. We got folks watching from Atlanta, folks watching from England, and everywhere in between uh, to celebrate at certain points we touch, which is Lauren John Joseph's brand new novel, Hot Off the Presses. It is their first novel. Lauren John Joseph was born in Liverpool and lives in London. Their film and performance work has been shown internationally across the UK, US, Europe, and Asia. They're the author of the plays Boy in a Dress and A Generous Lover, and the experimental prose volume Everything Must Go. The book we're celebrating is, of course, their first novel, and they're here in conversation today with Kara's favorite, Davy Davis. Davy is the author of the novels The Earthquake Room and X. They write a weekly newsletter about art, culture, sexuality, and popular queer discourse at itsdavid.substack.com, which I will put in the chat. And they tweet at Kate Bush Official. Uh, we are really, really, really excited about this conversation. Um, this is a conversation that as soon as uh, as soon as we heard about your book, uh, we were like, we, we have to host this event. So I'm delighted we could make it happen. We know that December is often a busy time for many folks and uh, getting to do international events um, is a wonderful gift of uh, an otherwise terrible pandemic. So we're, we're delighted to have you both here. We really um, respect both of your, your art and work. Um, so we wanna encourage folks to ask questions in the chat if you want, but mostly we're just gonna uh, kick back and enjoy this conversation between two, uh, two of our favorite novelists. So welcome to you both. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you for Hi, Davey. Lauren. Hi, I'm so excited. Okay, wait, before we get into it, I have to show everyone, like, I, I'm a dog ear person, and I'm also, like, a marginalia person, so it's just, like, the whole Ooh. thing is marked up. It's, this book is so, <laughs> like, smart, clever, like, it's, it's very, um, it's easy to feel kind of, like, dismissive when you call something a page turner, but I mean that, like, the best possible way. Um, so I, I rec like, please read this book. It's really, really good. Um, dishy, glamorous, fun, funny, very sexy, but also, you know, it has its like darkness as well. Um, so yeah, I'm very excited to talk to you about it. One does what one can. <laughs> one has done a lot. <laughs> um, That's true. Well, then I, I won't, I won't delay any, any further. Um, I'll get into questions, which I have a lot. Um, I have to restrain myself. Um, but just I'm really glad to be having this conversation with you, actually. I'm really glad that you would make time in your own busy schedule for it. So thank you. Oh, yeah, of course. It's my, my pleasure. Um, uh, so at certain points uh, begins with its narrator, JJ, setting out to put a messy international years-long romance stand on digital paper. Uh, piecing together the ephemera of a decade, JJ writes that they're trying to muster the art of cinematic collage. And this is a very cinematic novel, right? It's, there are all of these references to the golden age of Hollywood and, and to cinema in general, you know, Marlena Dietrich, Rita Hayworth, uh, Joan Crawford. Um, it, it's very much connected, right? And in, in tune with cinema. Um, and as a multidisciplinary artist yourself, I, I was really wondering, you know, throughout kind of about this connection. Um, do you think that cinema comes closer to capturing reality than literature does? Uh, which is kind of an unfair question. So maybe a better question would be, what what does cinema do that literature can't and vice versa? Um, it's such a funny question because I suppose you, had, you would have to have some understanding of reality. Um, and I'm not, I wouldn't consider myself an expert on reality, having managed to, um, you know, fabricate my own reality for the past couple of decades. Um, but yes, it's absolutely a cinematic novel. And I think that um, what I love about the movies that most resonate with me is the same as that which resonates with me in my favorite novels is that they, um, they both offer a depth and uh, they invite a reader or a viewer into a world uh, without that person being uh, alienated or being purely a voyeur. You know, like when a novel works or when a movie works, whether that's, I don't know, um, 
King of Comedy or Star Wars or Tale of Two Cities. You know, we don't live in any of those worlds, but the, as, as works, they led us in very deeply into a world which is not our own um, without sort of patronizing us. It's like, this is how it works, you know? Mm. And you as the uh, viewer or the reader can go straight into that world. So I'm very excited by works that offer that kind of entry point um, mm. and allow you to spend a lot of time in those worlds. And I think that's what's really exciting about novels is that, especially a big whacking 100,000 word novel, um, that the reader spends a lot of time with those characters and in that world. Um, it's not like uh, a performance, which is kind of discreet. You know, it happens and then it's gone. It's ephemeral. But mm. novels and movies, the ones that I love, aren't like that. So I think I love them for similar reasons, the, the movies and books that I love. Um, but I, I would also say that the, the movies that I love or the auteurs that I love are more sort of novelistic than they are movie makers in a sort of dramatic theatrical tradition. You know, I really love um, certain Robert Altman movies that I don't know, you, you, you go with, with them in a way that you do with a very intoxicating, involving novel, as opposed to a movie that borrows more from a dramatic or a theatrical tradition, where you're like waiting for certain beats, and you know, you know, there's a there's a point to be made by these works. So mm -hmm. yeah, I, I I do like those kind of works that so overlap maybe, and and inform each other. Yeah, so maybe the better way for phrasing that question would have been like triangulating it with the stage too, or like performance. It's funny, I, I'm like mm -hmm. that idea of, you know, when a work really does its job, it allows you to kind of transcend that voyeur role is really interesting to mm -hmm. me. Because on its face, it's like um, with a film, I'm just, I am sitting and watching or with a book, I'm sitting and reading. Yes. The, the X factor, right, is like bringing you bringing you into it, especially with something, you know, like you can pick it up and read it over and over and return to your dog ears and have like, um, have this experience that is at once ephemeral and much longer term. Um, I, yeah, I also think that, um, that the books that I love and the movies that I love, um, they don't require you to suspend your disbelief, that kind of old cliche about when something is successful. You're kind of like disbelief and your belief are at the same time happening. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so you, you aren't required to believe that every word of this book is the actual truth, but it doesn't really matter whether it is or not, because it is the truth. The truth is elsewhere. It's not in like the factual retelling. There's a kind of emotional truth that sometimes goes along with a kind of disbelief, you know, which is, I suppose, why I don't know, fairy tales and myths are so eternal, you know, because yeah. we don't actually have to believe in Greek heroes who kill their father, marry their mother, solve the riddle of the Sphinx for us to mm -hmm. feel, you know, for the power and the, and the emotion and the, and, the, and the drama and everything else to come across. But for the mechanics of it, we have to believe that those things happen in order for the uh, emotional truth to come through. So I, I think that's another thing that I love between both genres or uh, media rather. Yeah. Also, I would say that in this book, there's, um, there are a lot of references to movie stars um, as sort of little images to, to stud through the book. But also there are um, people are compared to movie stars. There's a, there's a section where one of the friends of JJ is um, seen in, a, in an unfamiliar location. And JJ says that, seeing them there is like watching a, a minor star on screen before they have their big break. Like if you go back and watch All About Eve and there's a scene with Marilyn Monroe in there. Mm -hmm. And then when you see her in that, you're like, wait, is that Marilyn Monroe before she was Marilyn Monroe? So how, so how that kind of framing and recontextualization can really change how you understand the character. And there's a lot of framing going on in, in this book, you know, Lots of uh, people being seen when they don't know they're being seen and people mm -hmm. being remembered whilst that person who is being remembered is also remembering. So I think there's something cinematic about that, about being very um, deliberate about the frame that we're looking through. I think I borrowed yeah. that from 
movement. Yeah. It's, it's like an emotional like composition, and and that and I that totally came through for me while I was reading it. Right, it's you have um, like as as JJ is writing. Uh, you know, this history of a romance um, with this other person, Thomas James, it feels very authentic and very natural. But at the same time, as you're reading it, it there is this sense of like having like a director's eye, right? Like it, it, it and that kind mm -hmm. of makes me kind of think what, of what you were just saying about that suspension of disbelief where you are on the one hand kind of brought into this really like natural feeling um, narrative flow while well, at the same time you have like this craft overlaid on top of it which is like the best experience right it's it, it, it's not um, uh, a documentary right it's it's that there is like this um, I mean it's a novel right there's like this fictionalized narrative that allows you to kind of enjoy that uh, that cinematic experience and that artistic experience without it feeling it's at once contrived and real you know what I mean um, sure Yes, I'm very interested in artifice on many levels. I often think about um, some Iris Murdoch novels, uh, maybe Under the Net is a good example, where she's a great writer. And then there's there's some scenes in that book, you know, that she the, the, the lead character finds a dog and then they end up on a movie set and then someone sets up a bomb. And you have to think, like, is she playing a joke on us? Is she saying, oh, by the way, this is a novel? Like, obviously, this is a novel. This is pure construction and artifice and set pieces. So I, I really like to be able to do that, to write very rich um, relationships and mm -hmm. then to have something which um, is like a big set piece, really, in the middle of it. It's a little bit like, I suppose, you know, um, uh, in classic noirs even, you would have a, a dance sequence where mm -hmm. you've got Rita Hayworth, you know, having a little boogie for four minutes and you're like, is this strictly necessary? Um, mm -hmm. And on a way it is, it tells you something about the character and the world of the character, but also it's about heightened glamour and artifice, you mm -hmm. know, which I think is quite integral to movies, obviously, but also I think it has a place in novels as well. Well, it's like a microcosm of, it's like, oh, is art necessary? And then you're brought in further, you know, something like, uh, like a like a dance sequence with Louis Hayworth, and you're like, well, does is is this how important is this to the plot? And you're like, well, but how important mm -hmm. is is any of it? You know, like sometimes you're just enjoying sure an experience, um, which is also you know like I feel like that kind of that kind of question that these ideas of like artifice and glamour as they're wound into narrative is kind of like it brings to light for me like all of the blends of, of genre and style that you've done with this book. Uh, you know, it's it's a love, mm -hmm. very intense, like passionate love story. It's a coming of age. Um, it's epistolary, right? Uh, for the 21st century, it's a person mm -hmm. who is, you know, writing letters to other people and writing about writing letters and writing story. And you could even make an argument for it being a picaresque. Um, like there's so much, yes. so much happening there. Um, and, and as I'm reading it, you know, all of it feels very, intentional and, and I was wondering kind of is that true is that is that my sense of is that correct was it kind of organic or how did that evolve I think that um my mind kind of works like that I do have kind of a a magpie mind and um and they, ADHD I, I, <laughs> I, I really think that um, that kind of almost defines me as a writer that different things catch my I, and um, I didn't really want to prioritize any of those things and say, oh, that's suitable for a novel. That's not suitable for a novel. You know, like you don't write about this, that's too low bright, bro, or low brow, or even that's too high brow. Um, I didn't want to shy away from anything that I thought would work to help the story. I didn't want to censor it. And I had a conversation very early on, I think over the first draft of this, I went to see Ali Smith and I said to her, Oh, what have I done here? Like with these constant references and like I'm talking about quantum physics and I'm talking about the book of the apocalypse and I'm talking about Joan Crawford. Like what am I just, have I lost the plot? And she said, no, it's a work that expands the imagination and expands maybe what the reader knows. So, you know, lean into that. And I thought, yeah, I'm going to, thanks Ali. Um, so I felt like I had a kind of 
license to do that. Yeah, um, and I'm so glad you also, did. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, that's okay. Um, also, I think um, it comes from a sort of naivete about genre. You know, I didn't study creative writing, so there are now, I, since I've been talking to novelists and readers and publishers for a long time um, around this book, um, and I didn't really know that there were certain things that happen in a novel as opposed to, you know, a picaresque or as to a person as a novella or, or so I was kind of naive about what might belong in a novel. So mm -hmm. I didn't really have the rules. Um, so I wasn't hindered by them, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, but also the majority of my friends in my twenties weren't writers, they were painters. So I was mm -hmm. spending time in people's studios um, and painters are really crazy people. You know, people think writers are odd, but painters are absolute lunatics. And the painters I knew, um, I had two very good friends called Stevie and Sophie, and they would paint things like, Stevie would paint these huge um, drawings of almost biblical um, or ecstatic scenes, which are also at the same time very erotic. And then he would, um, on top of it, write little bits of dialogue he heard in the street. Um, and then he would, show it with um, a jello in front of the painting and a broom handle stuck in the jello and he'd be like yeah this is my new work and i'd be like yeah of course it is like <laughs> why not so these are the people i was spending time with my friend sophie would paint incredibly um almost scientific illustrations mm -hmm. of deer or bison or whales and then in the background she'd have some almost cubist rendition of a piece of furniture mm -hmm. and then she would stencil over it and so that, I came of age with these people who, you know, who had such an expanded idea of what it was to paint. So I couldn't help but be inspired by that. Do you know what I mean? I feel in a way that there are parts of this book which are absolutely like putting a jello with a broom handle in it, you know, just because that particular lyric or image or reference or um, thumbnail sketch of contemporary quantum physics worked. And mm -hmm. I didn't feel like, no, no that's not what you put in the novel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's- it I also asks... really love- Oops. Oh, no, sorry, please. Um, I also really love this idea from Pedro Lemabel of the bastard genre. Um, they always, they wrote these things that were almost like historical documents and then like a chronica and then very bawdy novels at the same time. And all of their work, it's kind of like, wait, is this, a memoir or is this a farce mm -hmm. or is this a political statement and so they, they called it the bastard genre which i think is a really great way of thinking about writing actually it's born from kind of clear parents maybe but oh, but it, it is it is itself illegitimate yeah well and it's like that kind of um that kind of like amalgamation or like confusion of genre, right? Like it's it's easy for it to become, on the one hand, it can be like a distraction from the work because people are always trying to find out, well, what's real and what really happened to you? And mm -hmm. is this your life? Or is this, you know, is this false or, yes. but, then all, but then at the same time, that can be like a really like, frankly, like entertaining and fun and fascinating way to approach a work, you know, like kind of mm -hmm. trying to understand its relationship. Um, to the artist and the artist's life. And, and I think it would be, you know, naive to say that, um, not naive, I, I think like part of, a small part of the appeal of this book is kind of, for at least for me anyway, it was kind of like thinking about you and your life in relation to it, you know, and like, mm -hmm. That, that there's that element of like like I keep talking about how glamorous this book is, but there is like a the um, the element of the glamour of the artist, right? That comes into it and it mm -hmm. adds to um, the excitement and it adds to the experience. Um, and also, just to go back to um, talking about you know your inspirations with, with painters and uh, one thing I really loved about. Uh, about at certain points we touch is that there are so many of these like artistic references you know I I had to go and, and search like if even if I was already familiar with a painting like I would go and like google it and see what it looked like it added this other like wow. to reading the book right because you can go and kind of like it 
it's like another layer of the experience. I'm really glad you did that. I, I had kind of hoped that people would. I imagined that it's a book that you might want several tabs, several browser tabs open on. Um, yeah. And I kind of wrote it with several browser tabs open. Um, <laughs> because I just I really followed my curiosity sometimes an image would really suggest itself and I'd be like why what's going on here and so then I'd return to that painting that I'd scribbled notes about and and I'd like oh, okay sure this is what it had kind of subliminally uh, suggested to me and I would dig about a little further and often I'd I'd follow an image without knowing what it meant and then i would come to understand why it was suggesting itself to me i think also with this book i was kind of there was a perverse urge to resist a specific genre mm -hmm. really because on some of the early drafts when i showed it to agents who i didn't end up working with they would say i'm not sure if this is a novel or it's a memoir you need to make that clearer and i thought no i absolutely don't need to make that clearer Mm -hmm. um, if anything, I need to make it much more unclear. Um, mm -hmm. So th there was just a kind of perverse motivation to sort of muddy the waters, I suppose. And it, because also, like, th these distinctions between is it real, is it fictional, they're completely nonsensical. You know, if I had written a straight up memoir, I still would have written a work of fiction. There's that great um, Mackenzie Walk quote where she says, the I is itself fictitious. So if I would have tried to like write a very strict memoir, mm -hmm. it would have, I mean, I would have fabricated half of it anyway. Every time we tell a story to anybody, whether it's, you won't believe what happened to me at the grocery store, we tweak it mm -hmm. so as to emphasize our point. You know, we make it funnier or sadder mm -hmm. so that the listener says, oh yeah, that really sucks. Or, oh my God, I can't believe that happened. So obviously in a, in a considered work of art, then that's going to be even more so the case. So yeah, I was really trying to muddy the waters. I also, with this book was, especially when I was um, editing the final draft, I was thinking about, um, Garth Grenwell often talks about registers in writing. Mm. Um, and I took some of his classes and he spoke about like, what are the registers that your writing moves through? So I was really like trying to tune into the registers. And I would say that there's absolutely a kind of, um heightened um transatlantic mid-century sort of um glamour that I, that i've borrowed but i've also borrowed something profoundly catholic and biblical um in the registers there and a lot of like um extremely old-fashioned like camp sort of slang in there as well which is um quite dated and also a lot of the um dialectic and turns of phrases of liverpool where where i grew up and not privileged any of them mm. you know i've allowed it, the quick moves between all of these things between something very like almost sacred and something very profane and something very like um like a, a council estate or a housing project kind of conversation and then something very genteel and stylized mm -hmm. I had that thought about that, those language choices when I can't remember who says it or uses it, um, but they use the word uh, tight to talk about being drunk. And I was like, oh, what a throwback. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you, you see that yeah. throughout, it's like that, that register jumping, um, which actually is a good segue into my next question because you have that kind of like beautiful, you know, high art, Floor, these beautiful, gorgeous, lush floor descriptions of um, Mexico City and San Francisco and works of art um, and clothing, you know, that are very, um, you know, very romantic and, and even quite elevated. Um, but then, you know, in other, uh, in other contexts, specifically when you're writing about sex, I, I felt like there was a pretty stark contrast between those registers. I felt that there was this kind of like romantic, um, JJ's kind of like romantic voice. And then when they're writing about the sex that specifically that they're having with the, the object of their obsession, Thomas James, that it becomes, um, you know, kind of much more earthy, more direct, maybe even like utilitarian. Um, and it, it isn't to say that these things aren't sexy, sometimes even romantic, but there is a big kind of a big uh, gap between them. And 
there's this line that JJ has where they say when they're writing about seduction that the thrill was in the kill, not the feast. And I, I feel like that's kind of like a like a a shorthand for the way that the way that you're writing about sex versus romance in the novel. And I, I'd love if you could talk a little bit about that creative choice. Yeah, um, I mean, sex is actually very hard to write about, as you well know. You do it very successfully yourself. I don't know what your particular strategies are, but I found that um, in writing about it, people write a lot about sex, um, and they usually do it pretty badly because they kind of take the coward's way out and they move over to, like, image and metaphor, and it's the equivalent of, like, cutting away to billowing curtains mm -hmm. um or using like i think when you're using very intense abstract poetic language about sex mm -hmm. you it's so it doesn't help you communicate it doesn't help me communicate um what sex is like and so yeah i was trying to almost be like a b c about it like this went in here he <laughs> felt like that and mm -hmm. I, I found that there was against the rest of the book, which is quite florid, that that kind of reduction of language, um, I don't know, maybe there's some sort of Hemingway moment going on there when you strip it right back, mm -hmm. then um, people sort of fill in the blanks themselves. Mm -hmm. And it is very like, it's very graphic, but I think that in order for it to be graphic and powerful, it had to be sort of reduced in, um, in the sort of, um, yeah, the the florid baroque nature of the of the writing had to come down a bit. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, it's it's pretty frank, I think, and I also think that the shift is, has something to do with the fact that the protagonist JJ just sort of staggers through life, doesn't really make any decisions for themselves. Mm -hmm. Someone says, "Hey, why don't you move to the states?" And they're like, "Cool." And then someone's like, mm, "Why don't you do this?" why don't you be a stripper yeah great okay fine i'll do that um and the only time that they seem to actually know what they want is in sex mm -hmm. um and they know what they want um and it works out in sex and that's the only time that they have a clue basically so it needs a shift in register it was also important to be kind of graphic and frank um mm -hmm. about the sex because i wanted um jj's sexual identity and like their sexual desires to be very clear in that they're 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 trans feminine person but they're kind of sexually aggressive and mm. i haven't read mm, that character very often i don't think um and so i felt like i needed to kind of be kind of nuts and bolts with it um in order to put it across to people that you know there are very glamorous trans feminine people who are you know kind of aggressively sexual and tops or as morgan page always says blouses <laughs> 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 Such a great old phrase. Anybody who's um seen any conversations uh, about this book previously might be putting this on their um conversation bingo card uh, as to but yeah they've mentioned Morgan Page take a shot because <laughs> it's it's now one of the hallmarks. You can't talk about something bottoming without talking about Morgan. <laughs> no, you get you get fined. Um, so yeah. So it's, it's necessary. I, I, I think a lot of people do try to escape the pragmatics of sex because I think maybe it's not very successful, maybe you, um, or too explicit that it becomes kind of like a manual or people won't go with you there. But I found it to be actually the most conducive way to do it. There's one sex scene which is kind of like my little piss take of how people often write about sex. Is this like cod modern cod modernist section where um everyone's described as like limbs smashing together like a cubist masterpiece and you no know, it's kind of making a joke about sex writing in a way you know how people resort to these i don't find very sexy or useful um strategies mm -hmm. yeah that like that squeamishness that leads to that cutaway phenomenon right? the drapes mm -hmm. below the wind where not only does that deprive you know your reader of like the fuller experience um it also is for me whenever i come across that and that's not of course like 
to say that sex always must be written about in a certain specific way, but it takes for me, I'm like, oh, I lost confidence, right, in my guide, or like I'm less interested, right, because they've, instead of kind of keeping the camera trained on our subjects, they've pulled away at the last minute, you know? Yes. Um, but instead, you've Why given- Why did I do that when I- That's here. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it would be crazy that I would be so like emotionally frank and then when it comes to sex. Absolutely. Chicken out, you know? Yeah, and it puts us too, like like you were saying, like JJ is so passive in their life. You know, they're a world traveler. They they, they are really a person who is going, you know, having all of these adventures. Um, and, but but like you said, most of it kind of happens to them or they're kind of like, brought along by friends or they kind of stumble into it or come, you know, it's just something that kind of is out of their hands, except for mm -hmm. when they're having sex. Um, and it does this thing where it kind of like, even though it's very um, explicit and like you said, like there's like this Hemingway-esque like straightforwardness, um, it kind of is also dreamy for that reason because it's so different from all of our other experiences with with our narrator um and it also goes you know it does so much it does so much work to help us understand why they have such an intense um uh, obsessive connection with thomas james you know like it's 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 really well done i guess is you know the long and short of it um well thanks uh, but speaking of things that aren't quite as straightforward um, something else that I really loved about this book was the way that JJ's gender queerness is kind of drawn out, you know, like, especially, you know, with, you know, when we're talking about trans literature, like the trans tipping point, it's very, or you're talking about having to kind of be forced to define or being asked to define your genre, you know, as, as, as you're going through this process of trying to sell the book, it's very easy to get kind of sucked into needing to be legible in a really specific way so that it, you can be, you know, marketed, taxonomized, understood. It's like, oh, well, this book is written by this kind of person about this kind of person. But that's not what happens here. And at certain points we touch, right? Like you have to get pretty far into the novel um, and into JJ's, JJ's adulthood before they really start articulating the ways that uh, power, desire, gender um, shape their life as a trans feminine person. Um, and it, it seems like to me, that feels developmental, right? Like we're watching this person kind of gain this understanding of themselves. Um, and I was wondering, I, I would just love to know more about your thought process behind that. Um, and if you yeah. felt while you were writing the, the, a pressure to like be more definitive about JJ's gender. Um, I didn't feel a pressure. No, I, I think of this as sort of like a Romana class, like a sort of coming of age novel in a way. Um, and no, I mean, I didn't feel that pressure. I certainly didn't lean into that. Um, I think it's a question of the, uh, narrator in the book is kind of looking back on their younger self. And as they're doing that, as, as the writer in the book is writing the younger self, they kind of, they have a little character. They've made a character of the, of their younger self as you know, one cannot help but do as a writer. And so I suppose it's sort of like a little Proustian nod in, a, in, um, in Search of Lost Time, you have Proust and you're aware of Proust, the writer, and then there's the, the narrative voice and then there's the younger Proust. Mm -hmm. And you have this triangulation of those voices. Um, and so yes, I have my protagonist looking back on their younger self um, and sort of, trying to look at that person objectively as if they were a fictional character and saying oh yeah sure that's what was happening here and that's how we got to be there so there's there's that that them um, you're aware of the, the 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 protagonist as narrator is talking about how stories and narratives on memories are constructed mm -hmm. they say at one point that um writing the story of their lover, Thomas James, is um, in a way destroying him because he only exists now as this story, which has been fabricated by the narrator. And the narrator's kind of doing it to their younger self as well. You know, they're, they're fashioning a story of 
how this person got to be there. And looking back on themselves, they do have a sort of objectivity to say, oh, these are the forces that shaped you, i.e. me. These are the forces that shaped me. Um, they have a, they're, they're at a remove as well. And there's, mm -hmm. a, there's a lot of focus um, on them, almost as a historian, really, where they're revisiting old emails and old letters and old MySpace accounts in the way that um, they, you know, said about researching the history of Mexico City or something. They're, they're in a way a sort of historian of their own life. So, yes. I don't know why I'm starting to talk like little easy now. A historian <laughs> of their own life. Um, <laughs> no, I, 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 I think that JJ writes, I think that JJ writes about this, because like, like you say, like, that there is like this meta quality with our narrator where they're talking about memory, they're talking about um, like the construction of the self and others as it's happening while we're writing letters to other people or looking back at our old MySpace accounts or whatever. Um, there is so much like uh, philosophizing, right, about the experience of reproducing oneself, but then also like the, the self creation and destruction that happens throughout that. And it like, for as much as um, at certain points we touch plays across, across genre, um, I kept kind of coming back to like my, like my question about like what the novel form is, you know, like, it, like by raising all of these questions and by being so protean, you know, I kept kind of, I kept coming back to that question, kind of dwelling on it. And at one point JJ writes, uh, that a letter is a little sliver of eternity. Um, and so I want to know what you, what you think of, like what a novel is, which I know is like kind of an insane question, but, but I'd love to know what you think about that. Um, uh, a slightly larger slice of eternity, I suppose. <laughs> and that, that's, that's the, the beauty and failure of it, isn't it? That um, it is a, a part of something much bigger, but it's a very, kind of insignificant part of it. Um, or I should say it has as much significance as you give to it, mm -hmm. really. Um, I think I was very keen uh, with this in terms of the, uh, burying the protagonist's identity uh, or le definitely leaving it till a little bit later before it was, I don't know, discussed. Because I did want to resist um, this book being, you know, read in a specific way of like this is a this is a book about this kind of person and this kind of experience um and so i tried to bury that in a little way uh, maybe not bury it but hold back um mm -hmm. although obviously every review still says this transgender millennial narrator every mm -hmm. every time um, <laughs> and they often say as well an unnamed transgender millennial uh narrator even though this narrator is named many That's times in many ways interesting it's weird because they have so many obviously they're they're in the book is jj but all of their friends have nicknames for them as well so they have like five names in this book so the idea that they're unnamed is suggests to me that um people read this book in a certain way because obviously there was quite a vogue for unnamed narrators mm. and so people just bring that to it regardless of the fact that i've named the narrator for some people it's an unnamed narrator. Um, and for some people, this book will absolutely be a book about a transgender millennial. Um, you, because people read it, I suppose, the way they want to read it. Like, I think you spoke with about your book, how um, people respond to the protagonist differently, depending on how they've read the protagonist. Some people have thought of the protagonist Lee, right? Lee. Yeah. Um, as um as like some sort of leather dyke or like a non-binary person or a trans man like depending on how they read the book they like make the character up for themselves you know and so i was trying to resist giving it like a dominant narrative like this is a book about this experience and i really didn't want it to be a book about identity because it's basically a love story it's a love triangle mm -hmm. um i mean i can't escape from the fact that you know unless you are Jonathan Franzen, you know, your book is always going to be about a transgender millennial narrator. There's no escape from that. But I wanted to, I guess, like, not prioritize that. Yeah, I mean, it's like a very, um, 
straight kind of like reflexive choice if, if, if they're you know reading through this book and being like okay well there's no really set name for this person there's no really clear gender for this person so rather than um enjoy the ambiguity or or explore it or ask questions about it um what like just glossing over it or ignoring it or choosing to not talk about it because it's uncomfortable or confusing and almost in a way almost while I do I've definitely taken issue um you know with either me or characters in my book being mis misidentified when there is are very explicit like there's very explicit information about the kind of person that they are I almost prefer people kind of taking their the their char the characters and kind of like uh, they have a way of understanding it you know what I mean like they have a set way of understanding mm -hmm. it not the way that I intended or that I understand but I prefer that to that gloss right to like taking it and going like sure. transgender book and you know we're moving on it's like so boring you know um mm -hmm. so boring and reductive and like you said like this uh it made me think of um uh it made me think of Graham Greene actually like this this like very and I love romances I love love stories like it's one of my favorite, you know, the, like a like a charged like love hate sexual relationship is so is so pleasurable to read about, and that's very much the kind of book that this is. But then you can it's so, you know, if you turn it into like you said like an identity novel, you know, you lose that story or you don't get to see it for 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 what it is, which is really disappointing, um, and which is why I would encourage people to pick it up and read it, especially if you like that kind of thing, because um it's very well done um but that kind of gender thing leads me um into my next question um one of my working definitions of gender is that it is the th the other people that you want to be like or resemble um and, mm -hmm. J and jj um as a young queer person from an impoverished and sometimes violent background lower class background they they have their whole life had this yearning um, for beauty and escape and art and you know getting out from where they're from getting away from where they're from to something different and that kind of is in you set this up kind of in contrast with like what what might be expected for a book like this it's not like i was a child and i looked in the mirror and it was horrible i didn't see the gender i liked it's the what 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 this what this character's focus is is um glamour um it it made me wonder you know is glamour a gender or it made me kind of revisit my understanding of like what what gender is or could be um uh i don't know if you wanted to talk about that a little bit it's so glamorous it's like it's so good it like hits all of those all of those sweet spots you know <laughs> i think glamour is absolutely a gender and really the only valid gender um, <laughs> I, I was in discussion with um morgan m page and shula von reinhold earlier this fall um at an event about the queer baroque and we were discussing the root of the word glamour which is from old scots and it's related to the world that related to the word that also means enchantment mm -hmm. or bewitching and i think that's very much the key with um glamour glamour is about I don't know, casting a, the spell that sort of sets out your stall, you know, it's um, creating yourself through a kind of a supernatural artifice. And specifically for this character, um, yeah, they're, they're, they're using glamour as, a, as an escape, um, but not because they can't handle the world because they're sort of bringing it, bringing into being another world. Like when they sort of, have that magic mirror moment where they meet somebody at the post office who says, oh, you should really try this party. Um, and they do. And they meet all of these people and they, they feel like, oh, these are my people. And they were just here, you know, on, on the other side of the screen, but I didn't know how to break through. Um, my, my own childhood differs in a way to um, this child, the childhood of this protagonist, because I also grew up very poor. But I, I, I thought my my childhood was absolutely full of glamour, 
because um I thought my mother was the most glamorous person in the world. I remember my mother getting ready for like dinner parties and just she could have been like Gloria Vanderbilt or something. To me, I was absolutely spellbound by her. Um, and I, I also had an incredibly Catholic childhood, which is also really high glamour. And it's like oh. you're approaching the divine through like pure beauty, you know, like the beauty of song, obviously the surroundings, the the candles and the incense and the robes. So there's something very magical about and transformative about glamour. I don't mean that glamour um, is like, you know, getting stoned because you can't handle the world. I mean, glamour is a sort of way of taking hold of the world and taking the power you need from the world and yeah, casting your own spell. Because fundamentally glamour does not have to equate with wealth. Glamour doesn't belong to the House of Windsor or the Kardashians. I would even say that the Kardashians and the House of Windsor are antithetical to glamour because they all look like shit, let's face it. No matter how much money they're spending and how many facelifts they have and how many filters are applied to those horrible pictures of them in all those tacky magazines, they're not glamorous people. Um, mm. And I think it's important that especially queer people can know that they can access glamour and that, it, that, it, that it's, a, it's strength and it's self-realization. Mm -hmm. When I was um, a kid, I didn't grow up like wanting to be a Spice Girl or um, Britney Spears, you know what I mean? Um, I saw Joan Crawford in Mildred Pierce on television and immediately I was like, oh my God, that's me. Um, <laughs> I saw her and she was this like incredibly gla glamorous, beautiful, but powerful woman. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. you had no doubt that she would knock the head off your shoulders. And mm -hmm. I was like, yes, I don't, I, I have no interest in being, you know, like a sort of airhead model of femininity. I don't find that sexy. I don't find that empowering. Other people do, good for you. Mm -hmm. um, so I, that's the, and I, I think I was aware when I watched her that she was also pure artifice. I didn't know her backstory until years later, but I intuited it. And then obviously reading about her, knowing more about her, I found out that she also escaped um, a very violent childhood and was very poor and really just made herself out of what she had. And I found that incredibly inspiring. And um, and the protagonist likewise um, mm. is, is aware that there is this power to be seized. It's just that I think today, well, maybe not, maybe always, um, people have been hoodwinked into the idea that power is elsewhere, glamour is elsewhere. You know, it's not for you. Well, it's a very like femme, conf well, it's a very like, it's, it's the way in the way, in the ways in which femmes understand, right? That while what it, it appears to be artificial, right? As in con like this gender performance is fake in contrast to real genders, but the, the, mm. the femme, understanding of it is like, well, no, it's all produced, right? It's all drag, but yeah. some people are using it in a way that is intentional, um, empowering yes. and taking, yeah. you know, being queer or being trans, like for like closes doors and foreclose is supposed to like kind of foreclose you in one certain kind of life. But like as JJ experiences like time after time, um, that, the that feminist that glamness that like over the top artifice is actually how they are finding their people um mm -hmm. and it's also a kind of prejudice that um the idea that joan crawford's gender is a kind of drag but bob dylan's isn't you know what i mean um because it is uh <laughs> it's very constructed it's just that it kind of goes under the radar um you know simone de beauvoir one is not born a woman one becomes one I don't think anybody's born to any particular gender. They might have inflicted upon you, but you grow into it or you grow out of it or you recreate it for yourself. And it's the knowing and the seizing that is glamorous. Because I think there are plenty of masculine people and trans masculine people, especially, who are very glamorous um, and chic and sophisticated. And there's, a, there's an absolute glamour in that too, I think. I don't think glamour is specifically about lipstick and rouge glamour can absolutely be um a masculine expression of your gender if you're like seated in it 
and you've created it for yourself. Yeah, it's like the self, um, not self, what is, what is the word I'm looking for? Um, actualization? Yes, self-actualization, exactly. And then I think Joan Crawford is like such an icon for that, for all of the reasons that you mentioned. And I love, I mean, you yeah. know, like, we could we could have another hour to like just talk about her. Um, but she does come up, you know, like a few times explicitly and not so explicitly in the book um, and, and with all of JJ's kind of like meditations on uh, communication um, and, the, and the ways too that like their, their life and their story and their um, self-conception is influenced by being a millennial, being a person who um, straddles like this transition from the analog world, to, like the, the digital world, like the internet. Um, and I want to know what you think Joan Crawford would think about the internet, like, as like the Joan Crawford um, song. <laughs> I, oh gosh, you know, um, Joan Crawford, she ended her life in such a sad way, you know, she, mm -hmm. there were those pictures of her in the papers in the 60s and she, she looked terrible, she thought, and she that's said, awesome, right? if that's how they see me. Yeah, if that's how they see me, they'll never see me again. And in a way, so did Marlene Dieter. She did the same kind of thing. She thought she could no longer be what the public wanted from her. And to a lesser extent, maybe Greta Garbo. And that's very sad. I would have loved to have seen Joan Crawford in really good films in her later career, because she was a phenomenal actor. People think of her as just being like a movie star. But there are movies like Johnny Guitar. She's so fantastic in that. She's incredible in Mildred Pierce and in is it Autumn Leaves where she plays the wealthy socialite playwright? Uh, no, She's Autumn Leaves. Yes, oh no, Autumn Leaves. Sudden, sudden, sudden Fear. Sudden Fear, yeah. Autumn Leaves is yeah, sudden fear. a rich housewife. Um, yes. Yeah, so sudden Fear has this scene where she's in the closet and the man who's trying to kill her is in the room and you've just got like this for like three minutes. And it's absolutely incredible. I think it's up there with um, like the passion of Joan of Arc in terms of like pure cinematic brilliance. And if you watch Joan Crawford in, in these long shots, in these long scenes, no cuts, she's also a master of like physical acting. She can walk around a table, pick up a cigarette, light it whilst still keeping the conversation uh, going, you know, mm -hmm. and never, it's never stepping out of the light. She is the consummate film star. So I would love to have seen her be given decent roles later in life, um, as opposed to Trog. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I don't know if you've ever sat through Trog, but God, it is terrible. Um, so one part of me makes me want to say like, God, yeah, I would love to see what Joan was up to later in life if Joan would have been on the internet. Um, but I do also feel that being as she was a long-term alcoholic and an endless narcissist, she might have been more like Madonna on Instagram Live, you know what I mean? Yeah. Where you're like, oh, is this really necessary? Are you dismantling your legacy very quickly? Because um, there's also those, um, you know, when she wrote those like, my way of life, those mm -hmm. books, um, mm -hmm. or, the, or what she's always talking in the 60s about too many dirty hippies. Um, <laughs> <laughs> You sort of feel that <laughs> she wasn't yeah. a great modernizer. You know, yeah. she was a product of her times and she kind of wished it was still 1945, even in you know, 1970. So yeah. I don't know. I like to think that she might have become like a Jane Fonda. Maybe she'd be a climate activist. She'd have some tasteful work and, you know, she'd be, you know, so doing, she, uh, she would have gone back. To manages yeah. it her, yes. But I think she might have probably gone down the like Azalea Banks route and just being like drunk and insulting people. Um, yeah, and I mean, you know, the internet is, you know, the jury's out on whether it's good for any of us. So, you know, much less her. I, I like. think the jury's in and it's absolutely not good for <laughs> The jury's pretty in. This is like, <laughs> this is like the, <laughs> the one positive use of the internet, I think, is the two of us chatting, the rest of it. Yes, get it. yes. No. I was just talking about that with ER before we started, like just being able to talk to all these incredible, you know, writers over Zoom about their books, like that's, that's the only thing that I can think of. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, speaking of, I mean, I know we're running a little short on time and I don't know if we had any questions 
from the audience, but no, it looks like no. Okay, that's good. Then our timing is good. Um, one last thing before, um, before I guess we, we end it, which is something that just kind of came to me as we were talking about Joan Crawford, was that JJ recognizes like the kind of, um, the transitional, the, the, whatever it is about being a millennial is being like this like transition between technologies. And I was just thinking about how like, you know, she wasn't, she wasn't a star, I don't think at the, that point in the twenties of silent film, but she was in silent film and was able to kind of bridge that yeah. transition right to, into the top. Yeah. Um, and so in a way it's like, me, I'm like, maybe you only get, you know, one kind of like big technological, you know, transition in you and then the rest of it, then it, it just kind of like, <laughs> at that point it's out of your hands. You know what I mean? Um, but it'll give me, I'm, I, I don't know, like there's just like so much to think about, like as much as this book is like um, a story of love and obsession, it's also so much of a meditation about the way that we, remember and communicate and write and make art. And, and for that, I mean, for that reason alone, I think is extremely worthwhile. But if you like to have that with, also with like a sexy, exciting love story, you know, this is your book. <laughs> this is the book for you. <laughs> Very much so. Um, but let's see, I think, I think should ER come and play us out? I'll, I'll come I join so. her, I guess it's that point in the afternoon. Yes. Uh, great. Great. Um, thank you all both so much. This is a beautiful conversation. You're making me want to go watch. It's a good rainy day to watch movies here in Georgia. So that's perfect. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I want to encourage folks. Uh, you can buy Davy's book um, from Karis by X. It's Davy's most recent book. And, you know, I didn't really say this clearly at the beginning, but at certain points we touch is actually – not out in the U.S. until Tuesday. This is a pre-order event for our U.S. viewers. So um, go ahead and click this teal button at the bottom of the screen to buy at certain points we touch, and we will ship it to you. Uh, if you are not local to Atlanta, it will arrive to you on Tuesday. And if you're local in Atlanta, you can pick it up on Tuesday. That's the on-sale date. Um, so we're really honored to get to do a pre-sale event. Uh, it's always fun to get to help launch a book into the into the world. Um, obviously, it's been out uh, in your neck of the woods, but it's great to to get to help introduce it to U.S. audiences. I know that lots and lots of folks are going to connect with this book and be really excited about it. So thank you both for spending part of your day with us. Uh, I wish you both lots of success, continued success um, in, in all that you do. Thank you so much. Thanks, y'all. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Have a great day. Take care. Bye-bye.